It's hard to mark where exactly racing games as we know them began. Some credit Atari's 1973 release Space Race with the honor. Others go a little further back to Wipeout. A few even denote electromechanical arcade games which date back to as early as 1900 as the predecessors to racing games. A few of the more notable releases which most can agree on include the likes of Namco's Pole Position, Sega's Virtua Racing, Nintendo's Mario Kart series, EA's Need for Speed, Polyphony Digital's Gran Turismo, and Turn 10 Studios' Forza Motorsport series. But regardless of origin, racing games have seemingly always had a market, from casual arcade goers to hardcore fans who would compete for the top scores. It's Ridge Racer! My very first video game I ever played was actually a racing game called F-Zero for the Super Nintendo. Sure, I couldn't beat the game at my young age, but the fast-moving action combined with a really well-done soundtrack had me hooked. And I continued on to really get into the Mario Kart series, Cruisin' USA, Need for Speed, and Midnight Club. Ridge Racer! By the time Forza Horizon had been released for the Xbox 360, I had been out of trying new racing games for a bit. So my first exposure to the series was at a friend's house who had picked up the game on release. This new take on the Forza series saw it going from being constrained to a racetrack and instead decided to let players street race and explore around an open world in the fictional state of Colorado. The game piqued my curiosity as I've always been more of a kart slash street racer first and less of a no-nonsense track racer. And while I didn't wind up buying the game for myself since I was balls deep in PC gaming at this stage in my life, I did take a peek at the 3rd, 4th, and 5th installations as they came to Windows. Well, this year, Thrustmaster reached out to me to ask if I'd be willing to take on a sponsorship to promote their line of racing wheel peripherals. And it immediately came to mind that I could use this sponsor in tandem to finally look at a series that's had my curiosity for a while, but that I never really took the time to explore. So in this video, I'm going to be looking at Forza Horizon 1 through 5, and comparing the general differences in mechanics, the additions or subtractions between each game, and comparing the storyline... <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I'm too worried about the stories for this one, but I might touch on them here and there if something interesting sticks out. A couple of points before we start. Number one, the T248 racing wheel isn't compatible with the Xbox 360, which is what I'm going to be playing the first two games on. It does work fine with the Xbox One, Series X, and PC, but Horizon 3 and 4 are both older than the wheel, and this caused me to not be able to use it for those either. So the whole racing wheel concept isn't going to come into play until we get to the latest game. Secondly, I won't be beating these games to draw my conclusions. Seeing as there's going to be a point where each game stops throwing new mechanics at me and starts mixing up previous stuff to flesh out the end game. Once I feel comfortable in the fact that I've probably seen most of what the game has to offer, I'm going to move on to the next entry just so I can get this video out faster with less space on my hard drive used up. To the yeah. All right, let's start with um, the first game. So Forza Horizon was released in 2012 with developer Playground Games at the helm. The Horizon deviation meant that the game kept the Motorsport series large amount of cars and realistic physics, but changed the setting of a racetrack to roaming around Colorado and engaging in street races. The whole thing kicks off pretty quickly, actually. No splash screen, minimal menus, and you're off to the wonderful world of 2012, which is laced with every single recognizable EDM track from that era. I, um, the music actually pains me because I heard all of these songs ad nauseum when I was in college, and it reminds me of waking up drunk. Though that said, there are quite a few tracks from other genres which fit the game as well. I mean, props to Microsoft here for licensing these tracks for their game. They probably elevated it to a higher level than it would have been at otherwise. Plus, the soundtrack does fit the game's setting of a racing-themed festival, which is what Horizon's story is centered around. The game lets you start driving immediately after a brief cutscene, which has me realizing just how bad I am at this already. I start off by racing down the road towards the festival before crashing my way to the end against the game's antagonist who helpfully waits up for me when I decide it's time to total my car. Horizon does allow you to rewind time for a few seconds to correct any horrific crashes that you might find yourself in, much like Need for Speed or Grid. I imagine I'm going to be wearing out my Y button using this function. After this race concludes, the game launches into roughly three or so tutorial races that have you picking up various cars to mess around in. For the first one, we get to pilot the coveted 1995 Volkswagen Corrado. Now we're fucking talking, baby. Yeah, the game goes, hey, check out this nice car. Anyways, here's your piece of shit. 
To be fair though, you're immediately given a Mustang afterwards, and then a choice between a Mitsubishi or a Subaru, which really plays into the amount of vehicles in the game. From here, Horizon opens up into its main formula. You have a phase where you casually drive to your next race, and then the actual races themselves. I actually appreciated the casual driving a lot more than I thought I would, as Colorado is actually a pretty damn cool location to drive through. The game looks good for how old it is, and I appreciate a lot of the work that the devs put into the environment. You also have a point system which is reminiscent of games like Burnout, which nets you points for driving at high speeds, nearly missing other cars, pulling off sick drifts, and so on. Here I thought my drifting was bad because it kept slowing me down. Turns out that I was just driving with style. I do want to touch on the race that nets me the Mustang because it was probably one of the cooler moments of the game. Basically, you're racing a P-51 Mustang plane from checkpoint to checkpoint. The plane takes these wide, swooping arcs and then comes in for the checkpoint. And the sound design here is phenomenal. The funny thing is that even if you lose this race, they're like, oh man, well guess what? Monster Energy liked watching you flounder out there so much that you can still keep the car. Cool, thanks. At this stage, the only really unfortunate thing that I can dock this game for is the token system which plagued the Forza series from Motorsport 4 all the way up until Horizon 4. Basically, you could buy tokens for Horizon 1 through 3, and then use them to purchase cars without actually having to grind out credits for them. I would have no issue with a system like this existing in a free-to-play game, but a $60 full release? Yeah, not so good. Thankfully, the backlash eventually saw it removed from Motorsport 7 and never instated into Horizon 4 or 5 in the first place. But the remnants are still here in the older entries. What, you don't have enough credits? So treat yourself to a car token or two. You know, you really need that car you've been drooling over. <laughs> Either way, customization is amazingly detailed in this game. From painting and changing the looks of your car to upgrading individual facets of it which might give you a slight edge or a huge boost. Paints are free and give you the choice between normal, matte, and metallic. Decals are stupid and are just a bunch of real world companies. Which I guess you could use to try to make your car look more like an official, competitive racing vehicle if you want. But there's also that whole, take these shapes and combine them in layers and colors to come up with your own design kind of thing that quite a few games have utilized for their multiplayer. And I, I've never really been a huge fan of it just because I don't have the patience to try to come up with a cool design. But I guess I could see people having fun with it. But the actual upgrade aspect of the game is really fun for me. Basically, you can have the game do it for you if you want, and it'll try to budget as much of your money as possible into the letter rank that you're aiming for. But that said, if you know what your car needs more of, you're better off going in and doing it yourself. I believe the game would have put me just in the threshold of the B rank for my Mustang if I let it auto-upgrade, but I knew that I needed to upgrade its handling. So I stripped down the weight for a fraction of the price, and wound up getting a higher B rank than if I had let the game blow my entire budget on upgrades. Additionally, if you upgrade your cars too much at the start of the game, you're going to be ineligible for races which require your vehicle to be a certain rank or lower, meaning that you'll have to buy another car that's a lower rank, or that you'll actually have to pay for shittier parts to downgrade your car, which is horseshit. I mean, yeah, it makes sense, but it doesn't feel very good. So yeah, I guess that's the rub there. I don't think there's too much more to cover in terms of game-changing content, but there are many little things that combine to really turn this game into something special. Stuff like hidden barns which contain vehicles up for grabs around the open world, checkpoints to fast travel between, the option to pull up alongside NPCs and challenge them to a race, optional challenges which net you money if you complete them, speed traps which reward you for going as fast as possible, signs to smash which give you discounts at the parts shop, and so on. It's these little things that make the game so engaging to play, and really make the focus for me less about the actual big event races and more about earning street rep and finding new vehicles. I do have to say that making the fast travel cost money a lot of the time kind of sucks though, and I hardly ever used it because of that. Though maybe that wouldn't matter as much when I have loads of money at the end of the game. The end game goal here is to try to compete in races until you can upgrade your wristband. You do this six times, from yellow to green to blue to pink to orange to purple to gold. Each wristband color comes with a rival who will consistently be out in front the majority of the time. Beating them nets you extra cash at the end of each race as a bonus. 
When you get to the stage where you can upgrade your wristband, the rival will challenge you to a 1v1, with the prize being their vehicle. I don't feel like I need to run through each band color to get more out of this game from a commentary perspective, so I'm gonna wrap up the first game here. Overall, Forza Horizon holds up remarkably well for being a decade old. Even if those who are used to newer and shinier graphics might find the game a little harder to look at nowadays, I'm personally more impressed by how good this game looks for its time. There are some kinks when it comes to the older Xbox Live functionality and the existence of tokens, but the game really shines as a complimentary entry to the more focused motorsport series. If I were to compare what Horizon did for Forza to another series, I would say that it's a lot like what Tony Hawk's American Wasteland did for the Tony Hawk Pro Skater franchise. Where the Pro Skater games tended to be more about completing a level and moving on to the next one, American Wasteland had one seamless map that connected its levels together, while focusing more heavily on a story. This comparison can also be made between Forza Motorsport and Horizon, and I really enjoy the change of pace, scenery, and narrative. So let's move on to the second game to see what's changed. Forza Horizon 2 was still developed by Playground Games, but the 360 version specifically was ported by Sumo Digital. And that's where we run into the problem. The 360 couldn't handle a couple of key features and a lot of the smaller features that the second game was touting on release. With Playground Games going on to state that the 360 version and the Xbox One version were two completely different games. As such, the differences from what I could gather are as follows. One, obviously the difference in graphical quality, but maybe more importantly, the difference in engine. With the 360 version using the first Horizons engine and the One version using Forza Motorsport 5's engine. And secondly, the introduction of the Drivatar system into the Horizon part of the series would only occur on the Xbox One version and not the 360. Drivatars are something native to the very first Forza Motorsport game, and have been continuously improved upon since their first iteration. I won't go into their history, but at this stage when Horizon 2 was dropping, they were basically profiles created from machine learning by studying how players played online and injecting their driving habits into the AI, creating very human-like bot drivers. So yeah, with me being on the 360, I will not be seeing much of a difference from the first game where the bots would break all at the same time on curves. And the last big difference between the two versions would unfortunately be the thing that I was looking forward to the most for the second game, the dynamic weather system. This included the likes of rain, wind, and fog, all of which would probably red ring the 360. The minor differences on the other hand include less overall cars, less map that you can actually drive on, no DLC, eight players max in a game as opposed to the one's 12 players, less cosmetic dirtying and damaging of cars, less customization options for your vehicles, and less overall gameplay features and modes. So the big issue here is that talking about Horizon 2 without trying to get an Xbox One shipped to me in record time is going to be a problem with all of these major features missing. I'm not really going to have as much to talk about in the way of improvements, and there will be noticeable changes for those who have played the version that dropped on the Xbox One. So this section is probably going to be a lot shorter than the rest, uh, well, without all of this disclaimer, I guess. Just because I don't want to retread too much old ground if there isn't a huge difference between Horizon 1 and 2 on the 360. So Horizon 2 begins with a cinematic showcasing real-life cars and people racing around, attending another festival, and having a good time. Throughout it, a woman whispers to you about numbers. Five. Colored lights flurry in the distance. Six. The light shudder. Everything lost in a thin blue haze. Seven. Oh, I just keep the hearing the fucking numbers. It's very overdramatic, but it actually sets this game wholly apart in terms of tone from the first. Where Horizon 1 had much more of a raving party people kind of tone, which showed off a bombastic, crazy festival. Horizon 2 seems to be taking a more classy and less wild approach to that festival idea. The game takes place in parts of southern France and northern Italy, which is in stark contrast to the first game with its rolling lush hills and beautiful seaside roads. When you complete your first foray into the driving part of the game, you're given your choice of an A rank, B rank, or D rank car, which is an interesting list of choices. I do wonder if the lower rank ones have more potential? and I'm personally a fan of the Camaro myself, despite it being a D-ranked car. Still, I wind up taking the BMW Z4, as its rank combined with its potential sell price are too good to pass up. From here, we can race our new car once to get into the festivities and all that. 
The music in this game is, um, I don't know how else to describe it, but by calling it commercial music. Like, you know the music that you'll hear in some random iPhone commercial? It's just all of that. I'm sure there's a genre name for that, but uh, I don't really know what it is. Winning the race reveals that pretty much every other driver was using the same rank car that I was, and I imagine that choosing the other options would have reduced those ranks. The wristband system makes a comeback here as I net my yellow band upon crossing the finish line, but there is a change to it which I'll note in a minute. From here the game again opens up much like the previous entry, allowing you to choose which races you want to participate in while opening the map up for you to explore. The various shops, painting garage, and so on are all consolidated into the same hub, which is a good addition. The point system is immediately added to the game, and allows you to build up your reputation for various rewards as you might expect. You can buy cars directly from the pause menu, which you can sort and organize in just about any way that you need them to be organized. And this kind of stuff goes on and on, as nearly every single thing from the previous game is more or less now implemented in a much smoother way with tons of quality of life changes. Even the plane race is here, except this time with a Dodge Charger instead of a Mustang. Graphically, the game probably realistically maxes out the capability of the 360's hardware, as it somehow looks even better than the first game did. It makes sense with the game releasing at the end of the 360's life cycle, but it's still really cool to see. I mean, that said though, the grassy field type areas do get a little muddy at times, and the buildings are… secondary priorities as you might expect. There is one thing that I have an issue with though, personally, and it's the way that the game points out that there's something nearby to check out or do. Basically, you'll be driving along and suddenly this bright red or green balloon will just pop into existence to show you that there's something to do there. Mechanically, it's not a horrible idea, but man is it jarring to be cruising along and suddenly this pseudo water tower just shows up like someone constructed a Sims building. The biggest change for me personally is the game not constraining you to a race class, and instead adjusting around your car to make sure that the race is competitive. And it's kind of a weird mix of something that I like and dislike, because while I did find the concept of having to buy a new car or downgrade my current car to race in a C tier race to be really stupid at first, I actually kind of warmed up to the idea that I now had a collection of cars, which would be suitable for various races. But overall, I do like this change to the racing system, as it allows me to pick which vehicles I like the most instead of having to settle on buying a 1998 Honda Odyssey to participate in a single race. It ultimately led me to sinking a load of money on a car that I really wanted as a teenager, and souping it up to be better than the Lambo that I had been using before it. Handling-wise, this game does feel a lot better in terms of turning and braking over Horizon 1, and I still haven't quite figured out if that was due to my car or not. I always made sure to get my handling as high as possible on my a rank cars in the first game, but I almost always felt like I was sliding a little too much, drifting a little too far, and my turning and braking were just a little bit off. Things feel a lot better in this game, and to make sure that it wasn't in my head, I wound up buying a shittier D-tier vehicle and picking up a C-tier Lamborghini to figure out the difference in handling. And yeah, they obviously couldn't turn as tightly as my main car and skid it at higher speeds, but it wasn't ridiculous and the responsiveness felt much better than the first game. Though, again, with so many vehicles in these games, it's possible that the ones that I had in the first one just happened to be not the greatest with responsiveness. So I will tentatively say that handling is better in this game with the asterisk that I didn't try a large or even a medium amount of cars. One of the more notable differences for me was the addition of the perk system which you unlock once you hit a certain reputation threshold. It functions as you might expect, though the first perk is a mandatory choice which allows you to get more credits when you gain a new wristband. The rest of the perks affect stuff like more points for certain skills, bigger discounts, more credits for certain events, some multiplayer affecting perks, and so on. My personal favorite has got to be the top right corner which allows you to fast travel anywhere though. I've always been a sucker for a good perk system, so this is a very welcome addition to the series in my opinion. But this actually extends into the wristband system itself, which has been consolidated into the rep system of this game instead of remaining a separate entity. This basically means that instead of winning a certain amount of event races to gain a new wristband, you now gain XP to more or less earn perks and money. And once you cross into a certain level, you gain a new wristband color. I believe that there's a difference in the leveling systems between platforms here because I kept seeing that level 15 is when you get the green band. But I got mine at level 5. I found one other post on a forum saying that green is 5, so I'm going off of that here. 
but the claim is that the wristbands go all the way up to gold at level 500, which is insane if it's true. It is worth noting that the AI in this game on normal is much less aggressive than it was in the first game. There were several times in the first game where I'd have a nearly maxed out car for the race that I was participating in, and I would still have to try a couple of times to take first place. I haven't had a single issue winning a race on normal in the sequel though, and that's obviously not me bragging. I'm not saying this is a bad thing, it just makes me view the game differently. Whereas the first Horizon had me sweating on normal and made the game feel like a tough but fair challenge, the second game has me considering bumping up the difficulty in my races because I feel like I can handle it now. I guess it's the difference between feeling that the game is balanced around a challenge or balanced around a more leisurely time with the option for a challenge. Though, again, with the lack of a drive avatar system and an entirely different dev team working on the game, this might have not been an executive decision by Playground Games. But either way, I think that about does it for Horizon 2. Overall, Horizon 2 takes everything that the devs learned when building the first game, refines it, tunes it, and repackages it in a brand new setting with a more mature and grown-up festival kind of vibe. The music isn't as loud and in-your-face. The characters aren't as aggressive and cocky. Stuff like that. Now, I will say that even though I am all for that, some of the things that Horizon 1 did better were taking some of those more ridiculous facets and really making them fit in. Smashing signs for discounts? Yeah, sure. Racing a stunt plane? Hell yeah. Rivals which scoffed at you and belittled you? Yeah, that makes sense. We're at a fucking circus, basically. And that kind of Mad Max-ish, pumped-up, over-the-top mentality really fit the Horizon Festival, in my opinion, over the way the second game handled it because a lot of it was the same stuff while giving off this more grown-up vibe. And yet I pulled into someone's yard, tore up their grass, and smashed a sign before heading off to raid some barn with a Lamborghini in it. It just doesn't mesh as well in my mind. Italy's most romanticized region, Tuscany is tailor-made for those who love beauty. Florence and Tuscany are the perfect introduction to Italy's famed Dolce Vita. And now we can finally move over to Forza Horizon 3, which is set in Australia, which is a much better setting for a wilder festival in my eyes, as the intro has the announcers for the third Horizon event hooting and hollering about how great Australia is. Now at this stage I had thought my T248 would be ready to go for this game, but Horizon kept crashing, and I initially thought that it was only because of the newer wheel clashing with the older software. But oh my god, Forza Horizon 3 is an absolute train wreck on PC, with troubleshooting ranging from people needing to end a specific process that varies from PC to PC, to needing to disable the microphone, to restricting the FPS down to 60, to having issues with Nvidia G-Sync monitors, and so on. There's a reason why Microsoft has removed this game from every available PC storefront, and it should have been a red flag when I had to go to a gray market site to pick up a key for this video. I did eventually get it working, obviously, or this video's title would have been a bit more… creative. Even then, the game did freeze every so often. Alright, so Forza Horizon 3 begins with you piloting two different drivers on their way to get some cars to the festival which is starting up. This means that you get to experience driving a supercar along the road, and an off-road truck through the hills and along the beach. I'm gonna say this now, this game is fucking beautiful, especially for one that came out six years ago. You can never fault Forza for its graphics, I'll tell you that much. And I'm usually not even someone who cares that much about graphics, to be honest. But I think that racing games in particular rely on them a lot more, unless they're more arcadey. After you get done driving to the festival, you get to choose your avatar for the game, along with your name. I immediately regretted giving Microsoft permission to access my life when the name it defaulted to was my real name, but forgave them when I got to choose a nickname like Juggernaut, Colossus, Sausage, Mr. President, or Big Boss. From here on out, you're Big Boss. Actually, Big Boss is an apt descriptor of your role in this game, as you're the one in charge of a lot of how this festival functions in Horizon 3. This is an awesome concept, but it falls a little flat, which we'll get to in a moment. The first real race is against a jeep that's tied to a helicopter with a drunk pilot, which I've been told is an Australian thing and has nothing to do with the festival. When I defeat the duo in 1v2 racing combat, I gain fans. This is basically that system from the first game, but expanded to actually do something more than gain you money and reputation. This time, when you gain a certain amount of fans, you can expand the Horizon Festival's borders in an attempt to take over the entire continent, eventually establishing a new government filled with people who use credits as currency and live and die by racing. 
But you have to start small first. Gaining access to your first vehicle, signing on two out of a potential four for now radio stations, and beginning the process of going from event race to event race to pull in new fans. The music's pretty good so far, and I primarily found myself sticking to the Block Party station, which was playing artists like DMX, Aesop Rock, Run DMC, and so on. It is also worth noting that the game actually doesn't present you with stats for your first car, instead letting you choose your favorite, which is also the better way to go for the introduction in my opinion. Everything about Horizon 3 is a fantastic upgrade from the first two games so far, and I'm really enjoying myself here. I just wish the PC version wasn't so janky. Our first group of events has us participating in a couple of races as are the norm but one of them has us performing a big jump that's marked with a danger sign, which is a mechanic that's definitely more welcome in a wild environment like this. The idea was definitely there with some of Horizon 2's bucket list challenges, but I again feel like doing stuff like that in France and Italy doesn't make as much sense as it does here. Now we gotta talk about Drivatars a little more since they actually show up here. At first I assumed I was competing against recordings of people on my Xbox friends list but from what I've researched, it apparently takes the driving style of any friend who's played any Forza game from Motorsport 5 onward, and works its magic to make an AI which drives loosely based off of how they actually drive. Meaning I got my ass kicked by my former boss. Thanks for letting me relive that experience, Turn 10. After the first batch of events, it's time to expand the festival, which I was really excited about, but, um, the game goes, all right, cool, we've expanded the festival. Here's a new car and more shit to do. Oh, I was kind of hoping to choose what to add to the initial festival location or guide it in some way. Unfortunately, this isn't the case, as you instead begin setting up new locations for the festival as your primary goal. You can choose which locations you build at, which is nice at least. Gone is the wristband system as there's no need for the boss of Horizon to earn them, but you're still placing in the usual races, setting off speed traps, taking off jumps, using different vehicles for cross-country trips, and collecting racers to increase attraction to the event, which usually consists of your friends list. If I was still talking to any of these people on my list, I gotta say I'd probably be pretty stoked to collect my friends like Pokemon. My favorite part though has to be how much of a chat I feel like showing up at these places and just winning events and performing outlandish stunts. Yeah, okay, idiots, I'm racing a train today. Vehicle customization isn't too drastically different from the previous games, though the online community aspect is still available in 3, so you get stuff like community paint jobs and the like to choose from. And also there's no matte option. I love matte and they don't have it from 3 onward. You can also see what your car looks like when everything is exploded out, and can change your car horn and other smaller details that are cool to see. A bit of Halo stuff has worked into this game, which is a fun crossover for me because I love that series. Environmentally, this game is perfect for the Horizon theme like I mentioned before. There are sun-soaked beaches, densely packed rainforests, little suburbia areas where it's normal to plow through people's property, big cities where it's normal to plow through people's property, the dust-filled outback, and a snowy-ass mountain if you have the DLC. I do not have the DLC and don't care to buy it, so no snow for me this game. You can really see the sheer amount of effort that the devs put into making Horizon 3, as they apparently spent around 30 days just filming the Australian sky to ensure its accuracy with various weather conditions and times of day. Actually, here's one more fun fact. These guys wanted the ocean interacting with the beach to be as realistic as possible, so they reached out to Rare who was working on Sea of Thieves, and the two devs worked on improving each other's code to get things right. The experience system has done away with earning a guaranteed reward each level, and instead gives you a wheel to spin every level that can pay out a low amount of credits on the shittier end and a car on the high end. I overall like this change because gambling makes my monkey brain clap. And I'm glad that these guys didn't see this as a potential to add microtransactions to the game for more spins. The perk system also makes a comeback, and with three separate perk trees to boot. The festival boss tree starts you off with being able to add locations to your map permanently by heading into the game's drone mode and discovering stuff with the drone. Most of the rest of the festival boss's perks revolve around more credit, experience, and fan income though, which makes sense. There are a few which allow you to gain access to more interesting and flamboyant car horns, one which allows you to spin the wheel more times with your credits, the fast travel perk from the previous game, a perk that allows you to start at the front of the race line for four campaign races, and the most expensive one which unlocks an exclusive car for you to show off in. The skills tree on the other hand focuses more on… skills, meaning those things that get you points like drifting, burnouts, wrecking stuff, and so on. 
Most of these perks increase the points gained from these skills and extend the multipliers so that you can chain together. There's also a different end card than the previous tree, which is cool. And the final tree is the Instant Rewards tree, which instantly rewards you with wheel spins, XP, and credits. And of course, a car at the end if you didn't guess already. Overall, this is a solid batch of perks, and the system fits in really nicely with the rest of the game. I will say that the whole drone mode thing is a pile of shit, though. When you think of a drone, what do you think of? Right, those little annoying bugs in Halo. And what do those do? They fucking fly. They fly in the air. They fly. Yeah, the drone in Horizon 3 just hovers about six feet off the ground and is like you taking a car, but worse. So the whole discovery perk? Pretty much useless. I mean, it's cool for a photo mode type thing, but it's really not worth it to me to scout out locations and the like like it was supposed to be used for. The last couple of things that I really want to touch on before moving on to the next game would be the convoy system and the blueprint system. With the former, you can honk your horn at other named racers as you pass them by, and they'll join you by following you around, which gives you more points if you're pulling off stunts and the like. You can also challenge them to a race to your destination on the map, which makes traveling from point to point a little more fun. I've gotta say, I think having a couple of friends while playing these games has gotta be the optimal way to play them with stuff like this, as I could really see pulling up in a convoy and just going out to do stuff being the most fun that I could have with the game. The blueprint system, on the other hand, allows you to take whatever race you're participating in and lets you give it a custom theme, name, weather cycle, and so on. The cars allowed have to fit the theme, and the billing for the race or championship changes based off of it. It's a neat concept that really had me admiring the graphic design in a lot of these posters while feeling like I was really the boss of this circus. Overall, Horizon 3 is everything that I wanted out of this series, besides the drone. Had I played this one first and then gone back to one or two, I would have easily had a much worse time with them. This is the peak of the series so far, as the whole thing has been on an upward trajectory since the first entry. Australia is easily the best setting for this type of game, and the devs really went the extra mile to ensure that it was done right in terms of making it shine. While there are still a few kinks to work out with just how festival upgrading works, I've got a lot of faith in Playground to continue to keep this series on its toes going forward from here. Welcome to the United Kingdom. Fuck. No, but seriously, Horizon 4 kicks off with the absolute best intro in the series so far, which surprised me after the Australian intro. Basically, the game immediately showcases the biggest change to the environmental factors of the series so far, seasons. It starts you off in autumn and then works its way around to summer, showing off windy fall leaves, icy winter roads, a rain-drenched muddy spring, and a beautiful green summer. Now that said, we've got a bit of gamer dialogue that pops up right around spring that hurt me. Woohoo! Hey Blue, spread the needle with me. Red's down, red's down! No, not red! Yeah, the E3 presentation is in full effect from spring onward, which kind of ruined the momentum for me after winter. It's unfortunate, but with the game still revolving around this festival idea, I guess this is how they wanted to proceed with the hype of it. It's a really hard balance too tame and the destruction and chaos that the festival naturally exudes becomes more of a mismatch, and too over the top and your game becomes a lot cheesier than it needs to be. After this introduction, the game calls me out by my name and I continue to fear a robot uprising. Don't read my name off my own goddamn account, you fucking AI. Alright, you know the drill at this point as far as how this stuff goes. We're not the festival boss this time and instead have to qualify to race in each season by participating in events as usual. But after you get enough points to get to that stage, you basically have to burn time and earn fans until the season changes. It's not actually burning time, as there are intermediary events which take place between the qualification rounds, but it's a cool flavor bonus at least. These interim events have you doing some of the more wild stuff but with the proper justification that's more about why you would be doing these things instead of just being part of a festival to draw in a bigger crowd. For example, one of the big dangerous jumps has you becoming a stunt double for a movie star who looks suspiciously like your avatar. Performing this jump has you ranking up in a whole other experience bar which revolves around stunts like this, while also earning your usual credits, XP, and fans as is the norm. While this doesn't completely do away with the suspension of belief that comes with performing ridiculous stunts across the British countryside with no law intervention, it does at least put you in the mindset of someone who's a thrill seeker at an event as big as Horizon. 
I will say that these little side events have chapters to them, which was a little confusing seeing as once you complete the first chapter, there's a continue button which you can press to, well, presumably continue to the next chapter. But it's just a way to replay the first chapter, which is a weird UI decision. Either way, other stuff includes the more normal events like dirt racing, cross country, and street racing, and they each also have their own XP bars which you can use to progress to bigger races when you rank up. I do like the idea that's presented which states that the street races are being conducted under the nose of the festival boss, which gives them more of a lore reason for existing without the event being shut down. Which yeah, forts a lore, but hey, whatever, it's nice to see. Your music selection doesn't allow you to sign on new stations manually since you aren't the big hoss from the last game, which makes sense. But you do unlock some new stations eventually, which is always nice. The tracks here are as good as always, and I was still bumping the Block Party station most of the time. These guys constantly inject some pretty solid tracks into their game, which always enhances the enjoyment for me. This time around we have the likes of A Tribe Called Quest, Kendrick Lamar, and Anderson Pack, in addition to stuff like Queens of the Stone Age, Foo Fighters, and The Killers on the XS station. Environmentally, this game is absolutely gorgeous no matter what the season is. There's a lot more attention to detail in the buildings, the flora and fauna, and the extraneous details like the cobbled stone fences which line the roads, or the decorative rocks which dot country paths. It's always a beautiful sight to behold at nearly any given time, and it makes me happy to see the game so fleshed out, as even 3 got a little muddy in the more wildlife-filled areas. The XP system builds off of the previous game nicely, bringing back wheel spins per level while unlocking new events in your respective experience bars so as to not overwhelm you with everything at once. The wheel spins themselves, though, have the added bonus of new horns for your vehicles and items for your avatars. New pants, shirts, hats, and so on will show up on the wheel in addition to cars and credits from before, which is a cool addition that I enjoyed. But it goes a little further beyond that, as you can gain access to entire property which you can use to customize your avatar at any given time, changing its looks, outfit, and victory emotes. Of course, as you might expect, the first house is free, but I do like being able to snatch up houses across the UK like some kind of property goblin. The perk system returns with a more interesting flair, as instead of skill trees or the like, every car has its own set of perks which allow you to gain more points while driving, earn extra wheel spins, extra influence while driving the car, and so on. It's not something I saw coming with the evolution of the perk system, and I'm conflicted as to whether or not I enjoy it more than threes. But it isn't a bad system by any means, as it further rewards a player for sticking with a car that they really like. Plus, there are these things called super spins, which allow you to spin three times at once. I'm actually not sure where you get those from, because I got an absolute torrent of them when I opened the game's mail system. I mean, I went from normally progressing as always to having 41 cars, a load of clothing, some horns and emotes, and a half million in cash. So it was kind of hard to tell how the system is supposed to work, seeing as I suddenly just progressed through a decent chunk of it. I guess that's kind of what happens when you fire up a 2018 game four years later. Eventually, autumn strikes, and everyone's amazed that you're still alive. You're immediately thrown into a mandatory race, where you participate on the same dirt racing track that you did before, but with the muddy wet accents of fall presenting themselves in full force, denoting the replayability of each course based on the season. But after this, you're free to roam. Remember how I said that the game does well to not overwhelm you based off of the segregation of XP bars? Yeah, that's out the window now that we've done the beginner courses, as everything opens up at once in fall. It's fine, it's kind of what I expected. Still, it's hard to know where to start, which leads to me picking the events that got me most interested and taking them down one at a time. You're driving this. What can I say? Sometimes there are perks in this job. But yeah, it's pretty much business as usual from here on out. You can still design your own blueprints for certain races and the like, perform stunts, participate in dirt, cross country, and street races, and occasionally get to take on special events like the train race from the last game. The fall one has you racing a boat on land, which I've been told is an Irish tradition. Fundamentally, there isn't too much of a difference in terms of being the festival boss or not, as Horizon 4 still allows you to do what most of 3 let you do. I think the coolest bit is that you can progress to the next season without having to take place in showcase events, or mandatory events of any kind, as your points are given to you no matter what you participate in, even if you decide to free roam and hunt for barns and the like. When winter strikes, the game basically tells you to pick up a car with good traction and tires, or suffer it looking like this. 
I mean, of course this is intentional, just look at those points. Yeah, winter is its own beast, and it transforms the game significantly in a way that I should have expected but didn't quite comprehend the magnitude of until it actually happened. It really insists that you should buckle down and get ready for some slick roads, or just deal with your vehicle careening across the countryside like a bully who launched your Hot Wheels as hard as he could. Then again, I most definitely flat out ignored roads in the winter more than any other season since a lot of the water from before is frozen now. But that's about all I really have to say about Horizon 4. Overall, it's a solid addition to the series, with cameos from stuff like LEGO and Top Gear, plus games like Halo, Sea of Thieves, and Killer Instinct. The seasons are a wonderful change, which only really make an appearance in this game. I mean, they do show up in the next game, but not quite to this degree, and it really lends a unique flavor to this entry that can't be matched by the previous titles. Although the landscape can get comparatively dull when put up against Australia's wild environments, the imagery of the seasons shifting in that intro sequence are always going to be burned into my mind when I think about Horizon 4. Now all of that said, there are some negative points which bothered me more about this game than the previous entries, and I think a lot of it is the result of how much this stuff is marketed and approached nowadays with new titles. I mentioned previously that I skipped large gaps of content because I happened to open the mail to see what this game had given me. But since this game allows you to play the way that you want to, I was now a premier car collector who had amassed retroactive points from my collecting of cars and that immediately launched me from the middle of the fall season to the middle of winter. I know it was my own fault for getting curious, but I couldn't help but feel like the game was cheapened by this sudden boost. But more importantly, Horizon 4 occasionally interrupts you with unskippable cutscenes which advertises its DLC at you. I think this was basically the game catching up to the announcements which it may have given players who had continued to play Horizon 4 throughout its lifetime, but it was really annoying to be advertised at when I didn't care at all for the products. This would have easily been fixed with a skip button, but it wasn't. Alright, let's finally hit the latest game in the franchise, Forza Horizon 5. This one takes place in Mexico, which is probably on par in my opinion in terms of setting with Australia, just with the sheer amount of biomes which the country encompasses. Our intro starts with a plane dropping four different vehicles which you pilot to their respective finishes showing off an icy volcanic region with turbulent hills, country roads with a sandstorm at the end, a densely packed jungle with muddy paths, and a sunny road into the festival itself. It was hard to tell that this was Mexico without a sickly yellow filter to trick my American mind, but at least we got an orange filter in the sandstorm indicating Mars. From here we choose our avatar as you might expect, though it's worth noting that they're a lot less cross-eyed this time around. They also allow you to mix and match hairstyles, choose a hair color, prosthetics, pronouns, and your voice, which is pretty cool to see actually, and not something that I expected at all. I think that might be due to Microsoft more than Playground games. Your person talks back, which usually has them spouting off some lame dialogue or another about how they love cars and car accessories. Instead of a rookie driver trying to prove themselves or the boss of the festival, you're a pretty well-known superstar who came over from the UK to participate in the festival. Which is fine, it doesn't really matter seeing as this game immediately opens up into the usual stuff. Dirt, street, and cross-country races, speed traps, and all of the other stuff that the series has established and continued to insert itself into new games are all here. I'll touch on the new stuff in a bit, but let's finally break out this wheel now that I'm ready to roam around and do stuff. So playing this game with a racing wheel is insane. The T248's feedback and handling turns it into a completely different video game for me, which I know sounds ridiculously cliche, but god is it true. Alright, so you know how in the bottom right you'll see a casual 120 miles per hour or the like when you're moving at a decent pace? It is so easy to dissociate from what that number really means when you're using a regular controller. There have been a couple of times throughout these games where I have to remind myself, holy shit, 70 miles per hour is the limit on most US highways. Let me tell you, that reminder is no longer a concern with the wheel. I found myself drifting across roads and overcorrecting and flying off course so frequently that I wasn't sure what to do with myself until I slowed down and tried to drive like a normal human being. And this is exactly what the T248 does. It makes this game much more of a realistic experience than I thought was possible. The normal difficulty racers are way too good for me now. Racing at the max speed hardly ever happens unless I get a good straightaway. Braking is not only encouraged, it's required to not wipe out. And my god, any off-roading causes this thing to rumble like my desk was thrown into a blender. I was actually initially a little bit annoyed that I was getting smoked by the other racers, 
But then I realized that there was no shame in turning down the difficulty for practice, because it really is like driving a car. The more you practice, the better you're going to get. My wife was behind me filming the wheel while I drove and she said, I don't get it, it looks easy. This is coming from someone who has literally never driven a vehicle. So I let her have at it. Shit! Oh no, I made it! Fuck! Yeah, she changed her mind on the easiness, but I've also never seen her have so much fun with a game before. Dirt racing? Oh, let's fucking go! She played it for another hour before I wrestled it from her so I could continue but I really needed that break of watching her struggle to make me realize that this is kind of what wheel racing is about. No one is going to be able to speed down the road at 180 miles per hour while pulling off initial D drifting around hairpin turns on their first outing with a wheel. And so once I seized back control, I started just free roaming, learning how fast I could go down paved roads, getting used to the bumpy feedback on dirt paths, trying to learn how to drift, and just figuring out how to drive properly at higher speeds. I never got amazing at it, but I was eventually able to start beating bots and winning the first place at lower levels. And that felt really rewarding in a way that I honestly didn't expect. This product is an investment, one that heavily relies on your own attitude towards what you want to get out of it. If you're expecting to just blow people away and get upset with the hardware when you're not instantly going to become the next Andretti, then you're not really going to have a great time. But if you want that immersion of cruising around and bettering your driving skills a little at a time, the T248 is a fantastic purchase. Anyways, enough gushing for now. If you're interested in picking up one for yourself, feel free to check out the link in my description. So as you might have been able to see from the footage so far, Mexico is definitely a solid choice for Horizon 5 to take place in. I would probably put it toe-to-toe -to -toe with Australia in terms of what there is to drive around through, though obviously five years of graphical upgrades make a pretty big difference as far as the actual looks go. Race environments range from small villages with more detail added to the buildings than ever, to sprawling hillsides filled with native Mexican fauna, to beautiful coastal cruises, and everything in between. The weather, particularly the storms, is done amazingly. It's really fun to watch the sky darken and change with an approaching storm as the rain begins in a drizzle and builds up into a downpour. While the setting actually isn't my personal favorite of the environments across all games, I do appreciate its beauty quite a lot. The music is fine and features a lot more Latino influence and culture. It isn't quite my personal favorite, but I appreciate its inclusion to set the tone of the game a little more. The progression system keeps the same perk structure from the last game, cementing it as more than likely the final or near-final form of perks in these games. But what's newish here is the accolade system, which I like quite a lot. Basically, these are little achievements which you can do to unlock points and contribute towards your next big event in the story. When you rack up enough, you can expand the Horizon Festival the way that you want to, much like Australia's festival. I guess with you being a hotshot, you get to make the calls. But I feel like this was less of a decision of lore and more of a, hey, let's bring back this cool thing from the third game. Instead of setting up a new location event automatically, you instead choose a racing theme ranging from road races to dirt to cross country to street racing to stunts. Once you pick out your next leg of the journey, you're to participate in a more story-oriented expedition into uncharted territory. These are actually cooler than I thought they would be, even if some of the dialogue is a little lame. And they have you exploring hidden parts of Mexico to trample historic ruins with your cars and whatnot. When you finish the adventure, you build up the next leg of the festival in the theme that you chose. Additionally, you can decide to further upgrade previously existing legs of the festival, all of which have you performing tasks specific to that area. It's exactly what I wanted out of Horizon 3's festival system, and it's great to see the devs revisit that concept here to really make it shine. You can also complete certain tasks in your accolades menu to unlock new cars, clothing, wheel spins, and so on. These are pretty nice perks, which might cause you to gun for completing a certain task if you feel like it. And yes, wheel spins are here to stay, including the super spins. Your super spins can be unlocked from purchasing player houses, earning points in daily and weekly challenges and using them to buy spins, and finding a car with a super spin in its perks. You can also gain more points and other prizes just from collecting certain cars. Overall, I like what they did with the progression a lot, and I feel like this might be the final form of the series in terms of its experience and progression systems, as I personally can't think of a lot more that I would want out of it. But this is about all as far as how the bulk of the game works. There are a lot of small details, and I mean a lot, that I haven't quite touched on though. 
Off the top of my head, there's a bigger emphasis on photography, in which you can participate in specific events to snap a photo of something in particular, which is kind of cool. I'm kind of mixed on it myself, but I could see someone really enjoying it. There are also mini-games, which is an online-only thing that I never really messed with, but I could see probably enjoying a lot with friends. There are actually a lot of online features that I never really covered in any of these games just because it's not something that I'm personally looking for. There is online seasonal event stuff that lasts a predetermined amount of time and allows you to gain points in order to earn prizes. I gotta say though, the menus for this stuff are some of the biggest UI vomit clusterfuck that I've ever seen. I actually had to look up how to spend my Forzathon points just because I couldn't figure out where to do it from thumbing through the menus. But I knew that I could do it because the game told me that I could when I tried to use a super spin that I didn't have. The mail system is still here, and with it comes a shitload of gifts. I learned my lesson from the last time though and didn't open them until I felt ready this time. Man, these guys really like giving out their gifts. And this little stuff goes on and on into what I would imagine would take me another 15 or so minutes to get through. So I think I'm gonna cut off my description of the final game here. The Forza Horizon series is a welcome change from the motorsport scene, and does so much more than I ever thought that it would for Forza. Looking back, Horizon 1 kind of threw a lot of the series' concepts at the wall to see what would stick, and then every game did it just a little or a lot better every time. And I've never really critiqued less story-intensive games like these, or a game in the sports-slash-racing genre at all. But it's actually really refreshing to see this series genuinely improve from game to game mechanically. Environmentally, Horizon 4 was probably my favorite with how it handled its seasons. In terms of the best place for the fictional Horizon Festival, I still like the third game setting in Australia. As far as the mechanics revolving around how the festival's events go, the latest game wins the prize for me there, as it implemented all of the previous ideas fluidly while giving the expansion of festivities a little more flair. And while the first two games were obviously the lesser ones here, it's hard to pretend like they did nothing for the series, as each of them contributed to the mold which the later entries followed and expanded on. If you're more of a straight-laced, no-nonsense racer, I would say that this series should probably be passed by in favor for something a little more serious. But if you like your racing games with a little more character, Forza Horizon is a great series that I definitely recommend that you try at least once. Thanks for watching. I know this was a bit of a curveball for this channel, but hey, there's nothing wrong with exploring a different genre from time to time. Thanks again to Thrustmaster for sponsoring and pushing me to do something like this. It almost felt like a break in a way. For those of you who despise racing games and the like, don't worry, I'm gonna be back to my normal stuff with the next video. But until then, I've got shirts over at my merch shop. They got nothing to do with racing. Well, uh, no, wait, one of them does. Hell yeah, swoop racing. I've got a Twitch where I stream nearly every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I've got a Twitter where I tweet out my videos and sometimes an opinion or two. I've got a Discord where everyone else regales each other with their own opinion or two. And I've got a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.